morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our, of our series, Rooted in Love, the Episcopal Way. This morning, I'd like to start with a prayer. Um, today just happens to be the, the feast of Richard Hooker. Richard Hooker, um, who died in 1600, priest and theologian, and we're actually going to be talking about that stool there in a few moments, is attributed to Richard Hooker. And the collect for the Feast of Richard Hooker, November 3rd, is, I will pray, O God of truth and peace, you raised up your servant Richard Hooker in a day of bitter controversy to defend with sound reasoning and great charity the Catholic and Reformed religion. Grant that we may maintain the middle way, not as a compromise for the sake of peace, but as a comprehension for the sake of truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, this is purely by chance that today is the lesser feast of Richard Hooker. So who is Richard Hooker and why is he important to our continued discussion about our Episcopal beliefs, which are also Anglican beliefs? Richard Hooker, I'll give you a little bit about who he is, and I do have handouts after I'll, I'll give you before, you before you leave. But Richard Hooker was born in 1554 and died on November 2nd. That's why today is his, uh, his day, the day after. He was an, an English priest in the Church of England, a theologian who was very influential in his day. He was also part of a group sometimes called the Caroline Divines, or Carolinian Divines, which included people from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, such as uh, people like William Laud and George Herbert, who you may know. And all this is written down, so I'll, I'll pass this to you. He, um, he was uh, committed to faith as conveyed by Scripture and the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer, which we all know today. He um, regarded prayer as in, uh, theology in the same way as the early church fathers, those of the early church in the early centuries. He also was part of the, the understanding of the Anglican Church, or the Church of England, which all which became the Episcopal Church that we know. We talked a bit about that last week. With the with the um, understanding as the Via Media, the Via Media called is also known as the Middle Way. Anglican thought and worship theology is considered the via media. It's a middle way between the Protestant traditions of the Lutheran and Reformed churches, such as Presbyterian and so other and others, and the Roman Catholics, and the Roman Catholic uh, worship and theology and thought. And goes back to the earliest days of the Protestant Reformation, and includes theologians such as Thomas Cranmer, and Martin Bucer, and, and some others. This was at a very difficult time in the history of Europe with the Reformation and the changes that happened when the English church broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and placed the monarch as the head of the church, not the pope. And that, of course, was Henry VIII. Okay. So, and Richard Hooker, was one of the theologians that sort of was part of laying a groundwork for a different understanding of church and governance and, and the, the, just the whole general theology of how do you balance between, you have to remember, people died and were burned at the stake during that time of the Reformation and the civil wars that went on, and later on the civil war within England itself. Um, how do you balance between the extreme Protestantism, which totally disavowed anything with the Roman Catholic Church, 
and the theology and worship of the Roman Catholic Church. And that was part of this group that Richard Hooker was part of, the, the, the Caroline, Caroline Divines, or Carolinian Divines, that tried to come up with a middle way. And the Book of Common Prayer, which, which Reverend Judy will talk about, was an attempt to find that middle way in terms of theology and worship, where we have within the Eucharist itself, this, the bringing together of both sides and understandings of who Jesus is and how we and how do we worship Him as Son of God, and how even the Lord's Supper, how is that understood between a memorial or just a remembering that the Protestants claimed and the actual body and blood that the Roman Catholics claim. And the Book of Common Prayer brought that together. And both, both sort of phrases and, and understandings are used in our Eucharist. Do this in remembrance of me. It's also used at the same time as saying, this is my body and blood. So it brings together. So that's a little bit about the via media and who we are as, as uh, oops, Episcopalians, but very much Anglican. You know, so we don't. I don't want us to get caught up in, in in Episcopal, because really we are Anglican, but a branch of the Anglican Communion called the Episcopal Church. So our understanding, our theology, who we are, is Anglican thought and worship. Any questions about that? Any thoughts about that? Okay. And then the other person in the handout, I'm not going to go so much into him because I'm sure Judy will talk a bit about him, is a, is a guy named Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer uh, lived from 1489 to 1556. He was uh, one of the leaders of the English Reformation. He was also the Archbishop of Canterbury during Henry VIII and Edward VI. And for a short time under Mary I, but uh, that wasn't a good time for him. He was arrested as a heretic and burned at the stake because he broke away from the, the true Catholic faith, Roman Catholic faith. But Cranmer is known, and I'm not going to go into too much about it at this point, not only did he promote major reforms, he was the one who put together the Book of Common Prayer and specifically the first two editions of it, 1549 and 1552. And I, I, again, I won't take away anything from Reverend Judy, but I just want to point that out. Along with people like Richard Hooker, Thomas Cranmer, and others, we have what we understand as our, our theology, as Episcopalians, and our worship. Now, this is a really bad drawing here, of a, of a stool, right? Really bad drawing. Is part of is is part of our our faith? Okay. So, so some of you know, and I, I don't want Reverend Judy. Don't put your hand up. Okay. Okay. So within within our faith, we have this sort of example. It's the three three legged stool, right? And within it, Richard Hooker, or it's attributed to Richard Hooker from, from his teachings and his understanding of theology, where we are as Episcopalians and Anglicans in our thought. And he used this, this sort of image or this, uh, of a stool to describe three principles within our faith that make us a little different than some other denominations. Do we know what, okay, we talked briefly last week, I don't know if anyone remembers. Do you, do you know what the first, the first part of who we are as Episcopalians? Yep. Scripture. 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 Okay, let's go. Okay, Scripture. We believe in Scripture. We believe in the Holy, in Holy Scripture as a means to salvation, and that the Word of God is real and authentic. And I'll talk a bit of a little 
more later on when we get to a brief comment on catechism and uh, 39 articles. But scripture. Anyone else know what the other... Is it tradition and reason? Tradition and reason. You got, the, you got some of the stuff from last week. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tradition. So tradition and reason. Now, a lot of churches have that and that. This part here makes us very uniquely Episcopalian or an Anglican. So what do we say? So scripture is what? Scripture is the Bible and other other holy holy writings, but specifically the Bible. Tradition? What's tradition? What you've done before. What you've done before. The, the bishops and the, um, the, the way the bishops transfer down the line. Okay, so so we're talking about again um, part of our governance. So bishop, priest, deacons. Okay, tradition. Now, how far back do you think traditions go? All the way, as far back as we, okay. So traditions of the church, specifically. And what about that? Now that was not part of discussions much in the early church days. But you got to also understand what was happening around the time of the, the 1500s, the 1600s, what was going on in, around that time other than uh, um, a lot of uh, political dissent and civil wars and other things? What was happening sort of within the European continent and, and other areas? There was something happening that you could pull into this at the time of Rembrandt and other, and other people. What, what was going on? The Renaissance, the Enlightenment. The Renaissance, the Enlightenment, right? Reason, thinking. The one thing that attracted me to the to the Episcopal Church was the fact that, and you've heard the statement before from that people say, you don't park your brain at the door when you walk in. You ever hear that? No? So some of you have never heard that? There are some ooh, there are some churches that they're very heavy into this. But it's more about you do what we say and you believe what we tell you, but don't you sit back and try to, to uh, reason. Don't try to argue it. Don't try to, to, to sort of chew on it and digest it. Let's discuss it. Okay. Although, historically, that was very rabbinic. Time of Jesus and others. You'd sit and you'd argue, you'd fight, you would talk about stuff, you'd go through things, you would you would you would you would take take a certain thought or a teaching and you would you would continue to discuss it and and come up come with some, um, to some understanding. So people like Richard Hooker and others said reason has to be a part of faith. It's not just about being told what to believe, but you got to be able to think about it and, and have it become part of who you are. To turn it into action, you know, the idea of faith and action means thinking. There has to be some element of thinking involved to, to understand Scripture and where our traditions come from, why we do what we do, and this was very unique for its time and continues today. And the whole idea of the three-legged stool, that sort of image, if you, let's say, you don't, you have a lot of talk about scripture, but nothing on reason, what happens, like, like, like if you're thinking about it, you cut that off there. What happens to the stool? It falls over. Or the, or, or the other way around. Let's say you're all about tradition and the way you do things. And, and you are thinking about, you know, um, okay, we do have reason, we can think things out. But you, you, you know, scripture isn't important anymore. 
it's not going to balance, it's going to fall over too. You can't sit on it. So the whole idea of this image of the three-legged stool was that there needs to be a balance. Although it doesn't mean that some may not focus a little more on scripture or some a little more on tradition or, or some on you know, the much more liberals who might focus a lot on reason. But the idea that it still needs to be within a reasonable balance. And that makes us who we are today as Episcopal church members or Anglican in terms of thought and, and reason. It's, it's this sort of um, combination that makes us who we are. So why we believe what we believe, you know, there are certain, certain things within our own theology. We understand baptism to be a certain way. We understand the Eucharist to be a certain way. And we'll talk a bit, a bit about that a little later. But this is very much about, about who we are and how we balance all these different elements of faith and tradition. And, and we are allowed to think. We're allowed to think. And that's one of the elements that drew me into the church. Because I had a problem, and this is me personally, okay? I had a problem with people who shoved all this down my throat, and, but never wanted to talk about why do you believe this. Oh, well, no, no, you can't, you, well, you can't be a member of such and such church if you're going to try to argue it, or you're going to try to think too much, too much into it. This is what the way it is. This is the way it is. Well, I, I couldn't. I couldn't feel comfortable in certain kinds of churches because they didn't let me think. So I'm very grateful that I am part of a church that tries to balance these elements of, of tradition and scripture and reason, and that makes us uniquely Anglican or or Episcopalian. Yeah. I have a. Uh relatives and friends from fundamentalist churches who had said to me they didn't think the Episcopal Church uses the Bible much. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that is why. The reason. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Well, there are other churches, right, who are very, very scripture-based. Um, their worship will be primarily scripture uh, and preaching. They're very, you know, there's not a lot of liturgy, there's not, um, communion will be very rarely, it's the word, so the focus is all on the word. They may have some tradition, but a lot of those churches don't have, you know, uh, as long a, an existence to have lots of traditions, but they will have specific ways of what they do and why they do it. But yeah, they don't necessarily want people to question or to think. I mean, for the longest time, historically, people weren't really allowed to even do Bible studies. And that wasn't just a fundamentalist church thing. I mean, there were churches like Roman Catholic Church, for example, the teaching was the sermon, the teaching was what the priest said, period. They didn't even want people to have a, a their own Bible necessarily and they definitely didn't like the idea of a Bible in your own language that you could sit and study. Um, I, I can remember the day in the Roman Catholic Church when the priest from the pulpit told us that we should not try to read the Bible ourselves yeah. because we wouldn't understand it. That's right. And anything that we needed to know, he would tell us. <laughs> right. So it's not a. It's not just. Uh, again, I, I never like to talk about any particular church. But it's not that long ago, there were certain churches, even like the Roman Catholic Church, that did not want average parishioners in the pews to study the Bible. Because, well, you don't know what you're, you don't know what you, what, how to understand it. And the worst thing to do is to have a wrong understanding of Scripture. And yes, they, they actually did, did not have what we call what we take for granted as <laughs> just Bible studies and discussion groups and I mean there may have been but not formal ones not official not church one ones. yeah so one of the big one of the big things of course that was also a, a big issue back again into the 1500s 
was the whole idea of worship in your own language. Remember, the original the original worship was Latin, right? When the Anglican Church or Church of England was formed and a Book of Common Prayer was developed, one of the one of the main things about the Book of Common Prayer is that it was a, a book of prayer in the vernacular, in English, not in Latin. Not everyone understood Latin. You know, it was all the mystery. The priest was up there, said all these wonderful words, lifted the, you know, the, the chalice, the bread. A lot of times they didn't even know what it, what it was about. And then came along this crazy Church of England, which became known as the Anglican Church, and the Episcopal Church, that insisted on prayers and worship in your own language, and wherever in the world in, you, in that language. And the Bible, of course, I mean the printing press and, and the advantages of the printing press allowed Bibles to be eventually printed in languages. Now, there, were, there was a huge uh, fight over that whole idea. Again, that, that same thing about, well, you can't let the average person know what they're what they're reading or know what, what it's all about. You know, so that was, there was a huge political, like, the politics of it was huge. It wasn't just about religion. It was all about power and control. If you could control the people by not letting them really understand, and so you just say, this is the way it is, and you could control them more. So that's part of history. I mean, you went back a few hundred years, but sometimes it's still used today. But we won't go, you know, we'll just leave it at that. Um, we are also, uh, I mentioned last week, a creedal church. We have creeds. We have, in, a, in our worship, in the Book of Common Prayer, and I, I again, in the handout, I have it uh, printed out and what pages you can find things on. But we have the Apostles' Creed, and we have the Nicene Creed. Those are the two primary um, statements of faith. The word creed coming from credo, which means I believe, I believe. And there are summaries of our beliefs. So the Nicene Creed, of course, goes back to about 9, uh, 313 AD, the time of Constantine. It was an attempt to deal with um, uh, heresies of the time, uh, statements of, uh, of belief that were saying that and comments they were saying like Jesus was never a real person, he never really died on the cross. Uh, there were a whole bunch of um, teachings out there, false teachings, which Jesus actually himself warned against that one day there would be false teachers. So the Nicene Creed was an attempt to standardize the, the true faith. And But even prior to that was the Apostles' Creed, or what we call the Apostles' Creed which was really a, a used for baptisms. It was a statement, again, of some basic uh, sort of, uh, beliefs. And we've adopted them. They became part of our church and in our Book of Common Prayer. Now, there was there is another one that was not adopted, but it does exist. And the Church of England, in their Book of Common Prayer, still has it. And the old, and the old Canadian Book of Common Prayer has it as an extra. It's the Athanasian Creed. And I'm not going to go much into it. But I have, a, again, a little, a little summary of, what, of, of it. But it does exist and is in the Book of Common Prayer under the Historical Documents section way back in the 800 page numbers, 864, 1864. So you can read that at your own leisure. <laughs> it's a long creed and it has a whole bunch of stuff in it. But basically, that's another thing that makes us who we are. We are a church that has statements of belief, and the primary ones which we do use in worship, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. Any, any comments about that? Anything? Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to have you break up into uh, maybe a couple of groups, and we're going to talk about this. We are also known as the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And what I want you to do over the next maybe 10 minutes or so is talk about that. 
I want you to talk about that in your groups, and then we're going to try to define, well, what does that mean? We say it. Actually, it's in the creed. One holy, Catholic, apostolic church. So if we're saying these things, it helps to understand what does it mean to us. Like, what do these words mean? And the one of the biggest, of course, uh, misunderstandings tends to be this word. Okay? Because the Episcopal Church is a Catholic church. Okay? But it's not a Roman Catholic church. There's a big difference. There's lots of Catholic churches in the world. But that's not but that word actually has a specific meaning, the word Catholic. So what I want you to do is to maybe just break into two groups. It's kind of like divided here. And I want you to talk about it. Maybe have someone who can write some notes down. So I want you to look at the word what do you think the word one means? So like what so it's all about church. So what does it mean to be one church? A holy church, a Catholic church. An apostolic church. Well, I'd like you to think about that because, again, this is part of our belief system. Who are we as Episcopalians? And it all and it all ties in to to that foundation that makes us who we are. It's part of our within within the creed. So when we say one, what does one mean to you or to your group or one church, like one church, holy church, Catholic church? What do you what do you think it means by one? Bobby? So it's one one way of worship. So you say one way, okay, so okay. One way of worship. Okay, well put that down for a second. Oh. One day we will go through all of these and figure out what this is. <laughs> so one form of let's say one form of worship. One but, God. okay, keep going, yeah. One God. Believe in God. One God, yeah. Um, I think it means we're, Christ, we're Christian, right? There's one Christ. So, one, well, I'll put, uh, okay, I'll put Jesus down there. Okay. Anything else? Now, the only thing I'll say about, sorry, about worship, uh, we're, we're, if we're thinking specifically about the Episcopal Church, maybe, but even within the Episcopal Church, there's various worship. So I, I don't know if worship would fall into it, but we do have definitely one, you know, there's one, one uh, you know, belief in Jesus. Jesus. Regardless of what church we, someone belongs to, Jesus is definitely there, right? So we have the church as as one, and it's a it's a, a single united sort of global church where we all believe we all believe in God, we all believe in Jesus. Um, what's that? I'm sorry. What were you saying? Me? Yeah. Not one, it's two. Not one, it's... believe in the Trinity. Oh, okay, okay. But not, okay. We believe in the Trinity. But it's one God. But, it, but still, it's one one God. Yeah. Right? Um, but that the church, basically, in this case, that the church is one. That that it's one church. It's one church in, in the world. And that will actually relate to, the, to a, one of the other words in a moment. So what about holy... Are we a holy church? <laughs> How do you understand when you say holy, as far as a holy church? And remember, this is part of the statement of faith and creed. So one holy. So holy. How do you understand holy as this? What makes the okay? What makes the church holy? What makes the church holy? God. We answer to God. We, we don't take our we don't take laws from a government. We take the way we feel that we need to act from God. Okay. So, well, God is definitely there. 
Who do we call the head of our church? Who does scripture call the head of the church? Christ. No, <laughs> oh, the bishop would love to be there. <laughs> Hear that, Bishop? Yeah. Um, what is the church also called? What's another scriptural word for the for church in in the, in the Bible? Or as Saint Paul will call the church. Have you ever have you ever heard body of Christ? So Jesus as the Jesus as the head, the cornerstone. These are all images, eh, within within scripture. We are that the church is the body of Christ, Jesus is the head of the church. Right? And it doesn't mean that we in the church are perfect, because we're not, we are not perfect. But it means that the church and the sacraments of the church that they are all, all remain faithful and holy to the teachings of Christ. So it, it's about holy in the sense that at the head of the church is Jesus himself. We are the body of the church that, that has remained faithful to the teachings and to the, the, the sacraments of the church. It doesn't mean we're perfect. You know, we as people are not perfect, but that the church... The church as the body of Christ is called a, a holy church. Versus uh, a service group, like Rotary. The basis of who we are is Jesus Christ, who is holy, and the church itself that has been blessed and sent into the world is, is a holy church. Does that make, does that make sense? There's also reference in scripture to the church as the body as the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ. The church as the bride of Christ, yes. An image of Jesus as the bridegroom, and we are and the church as the, the bride of Christ. That's right. Now, the one word that always seems to throw a lot of people off. Catholic. And I and I heard some some right some right answers around. So Catholic. What does the word Catholic mean? And it's Catholic with a small c, really. Universal. 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 Right? That's why when the creed says Catholic Church in the creed, people wonder, oh, you're not Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Well, Catholic means universal. It's the word for universal. And again, there are many churches that use the word Catholic as part of their name. Roman Catholic is one version, or one denomination, might use the biggest denomination of, that uses the word Catholic, but, um, but Catholic, Catholic, uh, I'm not going to say it was appropriated by the Roman Catholics, but it's been understood that when you hear the word Catholic, you automatically think Roman Catholic. But the word itself really means universal. It's like the one holy, the one church, the holy universal church. And that's really what it means. So in the creed, when you have it in the creed, it really means universal. And that's the original meaning of, of the word Catholic. And then apostolic. We use that word too. What does apostolic mean? Or when you think of the word, let's say, apostle, okay, which apostolic comes from. So what, what does apostle mean? What, who's an apostle? Follower of Christ. Hmm? Follower of Christ. Okay, a follower of Christ, but, but specifically, are all people apostles? Has the idea of succession in it. Okay, there's succession in it. Yes, there is succession in it. But where did the word? But the word apostle itself. Who in the Bible are are, are identified as apostles? 
The, the, the twelve, right? The twelve were the original disciples of Jesus. There were a lot of followers of Jesus. I mean, people followed him all the time. There was like this outer group of, of, uh, of people who wanted to be disciples. But there was the inner group, you know? It was the executive club. It was the apostles. The disciples, they became apostles as ones who were, who were sent, sent out by Jesus who were directly commissioned, who were also witnesses of, of his death and resurrection. Who, who, they were very, um, not everyone are called apostles. The, the only ones who are called apostles really are the ones who, were, who experienced Jesus and were commissioned directly by Jesus. Um, although St. Paul calls himself an apostle because Jesus, Jesus did send him post like you post uh, a resurrection and ascension. So the apostolic church um, it, or means that we follow the beliefs of the church that was started actually at Pentecost officially with the coming of the Spirit and the tongues of fire, and that we follow the beliefs and, and practices and, uh, and, and teachings of the original apostles. So we're not a church that created our own teachings. Ours go back, right back to the beginning. And that's why scripture is so important, because scripture is filled with teachings from, the, from some of the original apostles too, right? So, or these are attributed to them. So one holy Catholic and apostolic church describes who we are, but we're not, you know, this, pulls us together as a, as a people of God. Any questions about that? That's very brief and quick, but I mean, you could go much more depth here. But does that make sense? And does that make sense about the word Catholic for those who wonder about that? So, okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to talk about, and we don't have a lot of time, this is more of a real crash course of things. <laughs> The word, the word sacrament. We are a sacramental church. You know, we are a church that has sacraments versus some churches that don't necessarily focus on sacraments. They, 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 I would say all churches have baptism even the most reformed or evangelical church will have baptism. And, and how they understand baptism might be different and who can be baptized and how you are baptized. Mm -hmm. But every church has, at least has baptism and periodically will have some semblance of a communion. Right? And those two, sorry, those two, baptism and Eucharist are the two primary sacraments of the church. You know why? You know why? They're the ones Jesus originally used. Did he use them? Or well, he did use. Yes, he did use them. But uh, is it just about using them? Sharing. Them. Share, share. Share. These two are considered well, for the ones that Jesus uh, initiated. Okay, and he's the one who says in Matthew 28, go into the world and baptize. So this is a, a specific command of Jesus, Matthew 28, go into the world and baptize. And then he gave kind of the formula we use to this day, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? And Jesus at the Last Supper, what we call the, you know, we say is the institution of the Last Supper. The night before Jesus was... Uh, crucified, and he shared the Passover meal with his disciples, and he went, and he's the one who took that Passover meal and created what we call the Lord's Supper, or Eucharist, or Communion. This is my body given for you and broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. These two are considered, in some churches, the only sacrament. We have, we have five other, um, some call them spiritual markers in the journey of faith. 
And some will say there are also five more sacraments. And again, depending where you stand in that range of, of uh, the, the Episcopal Church, whether you're low church, high church, remember what I was saying? It's not just about ceremony and, and smells and bells that make you high church. It's also a theology that, that dif differentiates people within the Episcopal Church. There, there is that sort of Protestant green side of it versus the more Catholic side. Okay, so it's not all about how you worship, it's also how you think. So those who are, um, there are some who will only focus on these two as actual sacraments. The other five are uh, reconciliation of a penitent or private confession, confirmation, matrimony or marriage, holy orders, ordination, bishops, priests, deacons, and holy unction, or the anointing of uh, the sick and dying with holy oil. So those five, some do consider as actual sacraments. And to identify why, what's the word sacrament mean? Well, sacred, yeah, okay, but what makes something a sacrament versus not a sacrament? Uh, okay, let me, let me give you an example. Um, if someone took a bath and washed themselves in, in a bath of water, is that a sacrament? Yes or no? No. Yeah. So what's different between that and baptism? Some, some do full immersion baptism, right? So what's the difference between a full dunk in a baptism pool versus a bath? It's blessed. It's blessed. So It's a symbol because you're believing in Jesus. You're taking Jesus as your personal Savior. Okay. So Jesus, somewhere in there Jesus is involved. It's a belief, so there's faith involved. But what else is involved? What else happens, or we believe happens within, let's say, these two things? What's the difference between me just breaking some bread and sharing with you, and sharing maybe a, a glass of wine with you versus the Eucharist? Ordination, isn't it? You're, you're oh. ordained to bless us. Okay. There's so, as we believe in the, in the Episcopal Church, the priest is ordained or blessed and blessed to be able to um, celebrate the Eucharist, right? But what is, but what else is there? You're, you're there, you're, you're almost, you're getting there for sure. The whole, the whole church is there. Okay, the body of, the body of Christ is is present. Well, is the minimum when two or three are gathered in my name, right? So it's about commu this community involved. But there's one other person involved in there. It's a baptism you're marked as a child of God. Okay, you're marked as a child of God. Is it, you're, you're getting there. You're getting close. Is it that old saying that it's an outward? Symbol of an inward and spiritual grace? Yeah, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So an outward and visible sign, bread and wine, water, outward signs, right? What's the inward and spiritual grace related to? The Holy Spirit. Ah, okay. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what... It's, it's that invisible grace, the whole, the grace of the Holy Spirit in that moment of baptism, boy, in that moment of baptism, or in the moment of the blessing of bread and wine, that makes it a sacrament. But what I also like all of, that all of you were saying 
It's also the people coming together, the body of Christ. That's why in the Episcopal Church, we are not allowed, a priest is not allowed just to do communion for him or herself. You have to have someone else present. That is part of that, is one of our... So like the private little masses that the Roman Catholic Church, uh, I don't know if they still do it, there was a time it became one one zone. I got the power and I could do it, and I I could have communion. You can't, you know. So two or three, two or three are to be present if there's an actual celebration of the Eucharist. So the Holy Spirit, and that's what makes something as we understand a sacrament. The Holy Spirit's involved. There's the outward signs the water or the bread and wine, the gathering of the people, the prayers, the singing, whatever, listening to scripture. But there's that inward, visible blessing. And that's the difference. So when, this, when the Holy Spirit's combined in those actions, outward actions, and, and symbols of or elements of bread, wine, water, whatever, it's a sacrament. And we are a sacramental church. We hold sacraments very close to our hearts because we believe that through the sacraments of baptism where you enter into the church and through the continual feeding of the Eucharist that brings that mystery of God, God and, and sort of world intersect at that moment of, of, the, of the Eucharist and we we hear those words, you know, we feed on Christ in our hearts with thanksgiving, that there's this mystery involved. We don't say we un totally understand it. I mean, that's God's work. We are, just, we are just meant to be faithful and to do our best to be the body of Christ that lives, lives the life of, of the following examples of Jesus seeking to be that it, all, that it comes together. And that's, again, what makes us who we are. But that's very much that Catholic side of us. If you were a very low church Episcopalian, Eucharist is really just a memorial. More like a, a Presbyterian would believe, or a Methodist might believe, or, uh, yeah, or even in some of the evangelical churches. It's, you're you're re reenacting it. Still, a, just still faith involved, but it's they don't they don't believe in the same way that we believe bread and wine that Christ is present in the Eucharist. It's more a, a memory of that moment of His sacrifice and giving. Yeah. Any questions about that? No. To me, <clears throat> baptism is simply being meant a washing away of sins at that time. And the Eucharist uh, is our acceptance of Jesus to be our Christ. Okay. So did you hear what he said in his understanding? So the baptism is a washing away of sins. It's dying. It's, and and it, we have it in our, in our baptism service. It's a, it's a dying of our old self being reborn, the waters of baptism, raised with Christ. Um, it's also an initiation. They call it initiation rite, where you become officially welcomed into the church and a member of that of the body of Christ. Uh, any comment on that? Any thoughts about that? When I was baptized in the Christian church, and it was a total immersion thing, yep. it was that I believed that Jesus was my Savior. So I, that's what sticks in my mind from that experience was I believed what the church was teaching and that Jesus was my own personal Savior. I mean, I totally, I, I, 
agree with Will in you know his assessment of that. But it was just about you know I've taken these classes and so I reached this point where I am I am right I am there. Thank you, Charlie. And there are churches that um, adult baptism or baptism of believer of a believer. Uh, you have to be older, uh, mid-teens to older, before you can be baptized. And what the whole idea is, you would have to make up your own mind and publicly state your, your belief system, right? Um, it was 11. Yeah. Now, the Episcopal Church has infant baptism which defines us differently from evangelical churches and even like Baptist churches and other churches where you have to be older before you can be baptized. What are your thoughts about that? Just stirring up the pot. Just, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's totally fine because later you are confirmed. You have right. a confirmation class. The confirmation right. when you're older. Right. Yeah. So we have confirmation, which is the reaffirmation of our baptismal vows. If you were baptized as a young child or an infant, so there's still the opportunity in the Episcopal Church for you to do that public statement of faith and belief and decide to take the path of following Jesus. Again, it might be your early teens, mid-teens, adult. Um, we have that within the church. Now, infant baptism was never, sorry, was never uh, opposed in the early church. In the early church, the time of, of uh, the apostles, I guess, be after Je after Jesus was gone, and the early church was starting to to uh, grow and spread. Usually, whole households were baptized. Usually, depended on the head of the household and. Just basically automatically everyone in the household, uh, wife, children, servant, if there's any servant or some sort of person, usually the whole household was baptized at the same time. Um, but the idea of confirmation is wonderful because it really does allow a person who doesn't remember their baptism, because they were a little too young at the time, a chance to make their own faith, faith statement and to be able to stand up and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, and this is what I believe. So, when I was a curate, when I was a curate, Father Nelson, I was in a church that wouldn't allow confirmation to anyone under 16. And the reason was, there was this tendency many years ago to push kids to be confirmed around age 11, 10, 11, 12, but it wasn't necessarily their decision. It may have been grandma's decision. It may have been the family tradition. It may have been the parents, you know, pushing it. But it wasn't necessarily the the young boy or girl's decision. So the church I was a curate in said, "No, we're gonna we will make sure that whoever comes forward to be confirmed, it's their choice." And there's something. There's you know that's. Not a bad thing necessarily, because it is it's a lifelong journey with Christ. And to be able to publicly receive that blessing from the bishop, from the laying on of hands, that kind of confirmation, it should be real. It should be a faith that is you know, the individual person's faith. So, so I understand some of those churches that wait later for baptism. However, Baptism is understood to be a sacrament. See, this is the difference between a sacrament and just a sign of becoming a member of a church. If we say the Holy Spirit is involved, that, that grace, that invisible sort of grace involved, the argument was for, for infant baptism was the child's blessed and the Holy Spirit is involved in that child's life right from the earliest point of their life, you know. Which, again, theologically, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of support and more arguments against it. 
Only time you mentioned baptism, um, there'd, there'd be people who would want their child baptized as a sign of like fire insurance. No, it's true. It's true. Um, again, that same church I was telling you about where I was a curate, the, it was a very much a Caribbean congregation. And when people, before they would go off to, to visit families back at uh, whatever Caribbean island they're from, if they had a baby not long before, they wanted to make sure the baby was baptized in case something happened on that trip and the baby goes to hell. No. That, that's not our understanding, and that's not what we believe as Episcopalians. But it's still very much entrenched in some people's minds that well, you got to get the kid baptized or get the kid done because it sort of protects them. Well, that's not really the point of, of, uh, of the spirit working in one's life. It's not insurance. But there's that element out there in some people's family traditions, perhaps, or depending on what background they grew up in. So, anyways, we wandered quite around, around that. But, um, but the whole idea that there are two main sacraments that are acknowledged in the church, coming directly from Jesus, and that what makes them sacra makes these a sacrament is the work of the Holy Spirit within them. So, so I'm going to stop it at that. Theology is never uh, simple uh, to to, uh, to go through and to teach, and it's only touching a little tiny bit. So what I gave you is hopefully just to make you curious enough to do some of your own research. Okay. Um, the next few weeks we're going to be dealing with spirituality. We're going to be dealing with the Book of Common Prayer itself, which is which will also help in your understanding. And I'm going to, and I left it with you. Um, I have in the, in the handout you're going to get to read over Two more things on your own in your own Book of Common Prayer. Historically, they're going back to the early Book of Common Prayer, there were the, something called the 39 Articles of Religion. And it's interesting to look at it. I mean, there are some things in it that represent some of the politics of the time. Very much so. But you'll find that Book of Common Prayer, page 867 to 876. You want to look at it over. There's history involved. It was adopted with some modifications by the General Convention of 1801. It made some, some political changes because some of it related to Church of England stuff and other things like that. And um, also omitted the Athanasian Creed. So there were some changes. But what else, what I do, sorry, what I do want you to look at and we don't necessarily talk much about as, as often these days is the catechism. And the catechism you'll also find, oh, I had the page number. Oh, sorry about that, I did have the page number listed. It's also in the, in the 800s. Read over the catechism and it talks about the Holy Trinity, Jesus as Son of God, talks about resurrection, talks about Holy Scripture as a, as a means of salvation talks about baptism, talks about the Lord's Supper, and so on. Something to look at. The, the Book of Common Prayer is a, such a, a wonderful resource, and i got to leave it more for, <laughs> for Reverend Judy to talk about. But if you want to know more about what do we believe as Episcopalians, go to the back of the Book of Common Prayer and look at the Catechism. Um, it's titled officially An Outline of the Faith. Uh, in, in the Book of Common Prayer, an outline of the faith commonly called the Catechism. And that's how it's titled. Look at that. How many of you actually have your own Book of Common Prayer? Well, you do. Because if you don't, we'll give you one. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. If you have your own favorite one that you maybe you've marked up, when it comes to Reverend Judy's um, sessions, which will be November 17th and November 24th, they can bring their own Book of Common Prayer? Yeah. Okay. Or 
bring your own book. If you don't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll have Book of Common Prayers, and she'll be taking you through some of the, the amazing discoveries that you'll find. Oh, wait, do I have handouts for you? Oh, yeah. So, but thank you. So coming out of this, do some of your own researching. Look at the history of Europe in the 1500s into the 1600s. And it'll give you a whole different sort of angle on what happened. You know, it's not just about Henry and, and, and his desire to get married again. There, there's a whole bunch of stuff that predates Henry. And I mentioned to the other group, one of my colleges was Wycliffe College in Toronto. John Wycliffe in the 1300s was one of the, one of the earliest vocal reformers. Although he, he was about 200 years too early for the Reformation. There, there's quite a history that, that started moving um, people in a direction of faith that would eventually create what we know as the Reformation and the split and the, and the formation of the Anglican Church, which is the Episcopal Church. So look at some of the history. And then look at, again, in, in the uh, Book of Common Prayer, look at the Catechism, and, and you'll get a better sense of who we are, what we, we believe. These are statements of what we, as Episcopalians, believe. And if there's something in there that you go, whoa, I didn't know that, and you yeah. want to talk about it, and you want to talk about it, bring it to the next classes, or just, or just let me know, and we'll talk about it more. But the next week is um, Deacon Becky. Deacon Becky will be doing uh, Episcopal and Anglican spirituality. So that, and she has some fantastic stuff to go past just the theology stuff that, we, that I was given to do. So and then you go into a, a broader area and, uh, and some practices too. I think some spiritual practices. So thank you, everyone. And I just want to finish with a, with a prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time to learn and to grow with, within our faith, to have new understandings, as well as new challenges. Help us to be followers of Jesus, be part of that one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that calls us to follow Christ. Guide us through your Holy Spirit. Make all that we do holy and special so that we in turn can not only grow in faith, but help others to grow in their faith. This we pray in Jesus' name.